morning, everybody. Um, my name is Mavis, this is Yvonne, and that is Alvado. Today we're going to present to you the Regional Food Security Reserve in Africa. Coming from Africa, Ghana, and having to reserve hunger and, uh, hunger and food crisis very closely, I'm very happy that ECOWAS, um, ECOWAS has put together this new mechanism. ECOWAS stands for Economic Community for West African State. One of the major things that uh, affects the uh, one of the major things that affect the continent Africa is hunger and food crisis. The objective of our research is to analyze how this reserve will stabilize food prices within the region, the causes of food prices, the current status of the regional reserve, example from other parts of the world, a conclusion and remarks. Food reserve is not a new thing that governments across the world use to control food uh, prices within the world. It's as old as civilization, and ancient, and ancient Egypt have been using it. Currently, rich countries like Indonesia, India, and China have also established food reserve. Looking at the food prices, it is very easy to say that um, the prices are, even though the prices are very volatile, it is very easy to say that it, it does not make a big changes. But imagine you are a family in Niger, which you spend 70 to 80 percent of your income on food. Little slight changes in price will affect your whole income. It will lead you to sell your farm. It will also lead you to sell your livestock. Which leads you to depend. This leaves nothing for you to depend on. We are in touch with a A A A I C. That that is in English is A E C I D. We are in touch with them, and we have forwarded some of our suggestions to them, which they will improve it on the food reserve that they are working on it in the region. There are a lot of causes that leads to hunger in Africa, and one of the major thing has to be with overpopulation. Just within 60 years, Niger has increased their population from 2.5 million to 50 million, which have huge demand on agriculture. And agriculture sector is also not developed much to meet these needs. So what does the region need that out to? And the region is also involved, is, the region is also prone to drafts, which is a bigger problem in that matter. Overgrazing and the development of agriculture sector, disease and infection, conflict and insecurity, barrier to market access are just few of the reasons that causes hunger in Africa. There are a lot of solutions that we can come up with, but to us, we see that these are the relevant solutions that if it's well tackled, it can help to uh, mitigate the food and hunger crisis within the region. Tackle the export restriction systems, and political stability, but dismantle support for biofuel is one of the main things that if it's well tackled, it can, it can help to mitigate the hunger within the region. So from these solutions, uh, we're gonna focus on the regional food reserve from the ECOWAS, but before explaining how it works, it is necessary to understand where it does it come from. Uh, as I mentioned, it's part of, it's part of the ECOWAS, which is formed uh, by 15 countries that you can see in the slide. And I made this diagram to just to make a little, to illustrate better how the political context is in place. There are some uh, institutions and initiatives going around the reserve. Uh, it may be a little bit complex, but the advantage is that there's an institutional umbrella in place. Some initiatives are being, for example, here the these ones uh, have, uh, are, are working to achieve the same goal, to, to avoid uh, redundance. And there's an economic unity, which is also an advantage for the region. Uh, as we mentioned, the region is working as an emergency aid, um, which has three specific objectives. And I want to highlight that they want to provide nutritional assistance, not just provide food, but considering also the dietary needs. Uh, they want to express regional solidarity because some countries may have to give more resources than others. And uh, they want to contribute to food sovereignty and the integration in West Africa. Uh, some key stakeholders to this reserve 
are the regional uh, organizations, uh, national organizations, uh, NGOs, and international partners. Uh, the size and composition, uh, it will, the aim is to achieve 411,000 tons of food uh, combined uh, of, made up from one third of physical reserves and two thirds of financial reserves. And it's, there's a plan uh, for eight years and it will be progressively built over time. Uh, in terms of location, I want to show you this map where you can see in red where are the sites uh, for storage. And uh, each site each site will have a body in charge. In terms of mobilization, uh, they have based uh, the decision on when to move the stocks based on the CHP that has five phases. And they have decided that when it reaches the critical food insecurity, which is level three, then they will use the stocks uh, to help the region. In terms of cost and funding, the average <coughs> annual cost is uh, $33 million. And the overall cost of the reserve is $263 million for the eight years plan. And it will be funded by the ECOWAS by the, by, and, and by your institutions. But there will be a special contribution from the G20. And they have also developed a mechanism called Zero Hunger in West Africa. Uh, which is about uh, using a levy in the total imported uh, goods in the region uh, to raise money, which will be basically paid by the West African consumers. So how can the reserve stabilize prices? Because that's what we want to uh, analyze, this emergency reserve, how can it also stabilize prices? Um, the idea is that the reserve can influence uh, consumers and producers' prices uh, by buying the food when the price is low and then selling it when the price is high. Um, the experience has shown that in the long term prices will increase, but this is not necessarily uh, uh, something bad because this gives farmers the confidence to invest in, in land, to buy more, more hectares and increase their productivity. Uh, you can build uh, reserves at the local uh, level, for example, to uh, help farmers deal with the interseasonal high prices. You can build stocks at national level uh, to stabilize the market and give consumers uh, uh, the opportunity to buy food at a, uh, to ensure affordability of the food. Uh, at the regional level, uh, it can uh, integrate the, le the, the region, of course, and also uh, tackle the regions where there's food scarcity. And at the global level, it can link uh, the three previous ones uh, to, to make it uh, more efficient. Okay, uh, the ECOWAS regional reserve is not the only one of its kind. Uh, Southeast Asia has a long history in this field and it has proven to be quite successful. It is similar in size and in objectives, although it's important to consider that the political, the geographical and the financial background is quite different. But we thought it was important to analyze this case and it proves that regional reserves can work. So I'm going to look a little bit at how it has evolved through history to show the level of commitment the, uh, the nations that form part of the Asian have to demonstrate. It started in 1979. And uh, here, uh, all the nations contributed voluntarily to our regional stockpile, achieving around 87,000 tons of rice, but this never was utilized. It was never approved. So then, in 2004, after a feasibility study, and with uh, three other nations, Japan, South Korea, and China, that acted as more or less as funders, they approved a new pilot project called the East Asian Emergency Rice Reserve. This was way better organized. It had a, a stronger financial system. And it proved to be quite successful as in the case you consider, where, for example, in the Tanfun in Ondo in the Philippines in 2006, they nearly reached 1,000 tons of rice to victims. And lately, due to the necessity of uh, creating a, permit, a permanent rice reserve, 
they created in 2012 the Asian Class 3 Emergency Rice Reserve, which has shown that it has a lot of level of commitment from all the members. It is financially strong and it's quite transparent. You, they have even a Facebook page where with uh, pictures that you can see all the reserves. So what can we learn from this case? That in order for a regional reserve to work, political commitment is essential. And that uh, the ECOWAS can learn from the transparency shown in this case. So what are the barriers and the limitations for the ECOWAS reserve to operate? One of the most important that affects West Africa the most is the political instability and the conflicts shown in the area. A lot of extreme religio religious fights, uh, rebel groups are forcing people to move out of their regions. This has a direct effect in the economy, affects the supply of food, further increasing prices, transportation, the terrible uh, road structure, uh, infrastructure doesn't allow the transportation of food from surplus areas to shortage areas, so this, this is an obvious effect for the well functioning of the, of the reserve. Countries are vulnerable to pressures in the international market that have a domino effect affecting the urban areas and then the rural areas. The operation cost of maintaining, uh, it is very expensive to maintain this kind of uh, reserves. It requires a high budget. And when you don't see the results, people tend to deviate the, the, the resources into other long term projects. <coughs> uh, the reserve also needs to consider the dietary needs, not only provide basic commodities. But a healthy balanced diet requires a wide range of minerals and nutrients that need to be uh, taken into consideration when building the stocks. Bureaucracy and institutional structure, this is a key point. And uh, while talking with ISC, the representatives, they told us that this is one of the ma major barriers because there are too many members, different interests, different. So it's hard to create uh, a decision in time to, to operate. And obviously, as I mentioned before, the lack of transparency in this organization. So they can learn from the Asian example that has proven to upload and update information constantly in the web. Um, so what are the recommendations learned from, this, from these barriers? Well, maybe a platform should, could be created, an internet platform where all organizations involved in the project could share the information. This, this also will allow transparency, or maybe learn from the Asian example and just simply do a Facebook page where the public can view all the pictures from the research. Maybe a trade surveillance system where they can see the, how the trade is evolving, where are the places, so they can identify the places with uh, shortages, the places with surpluses, and so act in time and, and look for transport systems in time to, to alleviate the problem. Um, we also thought about regional campaigns for promoted by NGOs to uh, help civil society to, society put pressure on the on the government to be more transparent and to fight uh, corruption because we believe that people uh, that takes uh, that it, that becomes more active in the political uh, aspect uh, are a good way of is a good way of of uh, tackling corruption. Uh, maybe also legal backing for cross-border trade. We have many barriers, uh, not only in the, in, the in the infrastructure aspect, but also in the, in the legal aspect. There's no, uh, uh, there are export uh, bans. There's many things that it's not allowing the region to move all the stocks as they should. And also maybe consider the bottom-up approach because as we said, it, there's a lot of bureaucracy. Um, so there have, they have experts, they have NGOs, they have done a lot of studies, but maybe they're forgetting about the people that's uh, suffering, the ones that actually need help, and they can give uh, valuable input uh, to make better decisions. We also talk about partnership, and in, in a situation where 15 states are involved, it is it will be very difficult if they are not actively committed in achieving the aim of the project. If the members are active, committed, and they all participate, achieving the aim of the project is very simple. G20 is part of the stakeholders, and we thought if they, are, if they demand for transparency and they insist that the right thing should be done and the, the purpose at which the money has been delivered should be used for, the, the project will be done on time and there will be transparency. With the conclusion bit, 
we thought that for both the consumer and the supplier to benefit from, all of them have to come together as a team to work to help to predict the market, the, um, the f to predict the food prices in the market, and also help that the distribution of the food goes to the right place at the right time. With the second point that we came about has to be with this kind of projects does not need anybody to be at place. It needs experienced people who monitor the cost of operation, which can lead to the better implementation of the regional system. And for the project to also be to for the project to also to be achieved successfully, clear and specific objective also needs to be in place. The right regional institution have to be in place and have to check that the right checks and balance are also being done. Well, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I think it's a, it's a complex one and, and it's full of ideas. I think it's a really important really one. Um, I was just thinking that you mentioned so many factors, uh, so many driving factors of, of kind of in, in Africa. But I was just maybe missing a uh, critical one, but obviously you can't cover everything in this presentation, so it's just an idea for future work on, on, on this issue. It's, you mentioned, for instance, the key role of price stabilization, but at the same time, uh, sometimes it's really necessary for farmers to have income stabilization at the same time, which is not exactly the same. And income stabilization sometimes is linked to some constraints in the natural resource base. So I was thinking about the links between food security and energy security and water security, for instance, which is critical at the moment. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was also thinking about how to build resilience in these communities to provide sustainable livelihoods within a context of climate change and disasters and, and all that. So I think that, that that would be critical as well. And. Uh, well, th but this is just to, to give you ideas on, on future work. I think that the presentation was, was quite consistent and, and internally very coherent. So, thank you. I also found it very interesting. Um, I think it would have been helpful at the start to, to have had clarity around your aim. I wasn't sure whether you were looking at simply at uh, price stability or whether you were actually doing a critical assessment of the, the overarching idea of the security systems. I think it would be flagged up that said, some really interesting issues emerged. Um, I think that Gonzalo's made a very good point about this, and it's the buzzword now in developing resilience. So looking at that in, in, uh, and linking it to the livelihoods of farmers, I think is important to explore. And also, I'm interested in where, it's a very practical question, where would this be based? Uh, that's actually one of the questions that we have in our conclusion. Um, because it's very difficult to make those decisions. I mean, we already we already have some sites uh, for the physical storage for the emergency reserve. But then, should they build like a, di a different, a separate reserve uh, to tackle the stabilization aspect, or s how can it work? Because there's different types of reserve. You have an emergency reserve and you have a strategic reserve that usually tackles more than one purpose, or uh, that has one than one purpose. So if it's going to be a, a strategic reserve to stabilize prices and to also help in emergency cases, then, I mean, we don't have the technical information to provide that kind of answer. So th this is but an idea, just again, yeah. clarification, this is an idea, because also it wasn't clear, is it something that's happening or is it something that you would like to suggest happens? The, I, I'm sorry, I missed that part. The, when I talked about the, the reserve, uh, it, I, for, I forgot to mention that it started last year. It was the first phase. Mm -hmm. And the second phase will start in 2017, and it's an eight-year eight plan. Sorry. So it's Can already it's working. Something about yeah. the there's a political conflict for this. Uh, uh, we, we've been uh, in contact with, uh, with, I think, right now within ECOWAS, uh, there is a, a fight between different sectors of ECOWAS on what should be the use of the food reserve. So originally, the food reserve had a, 
a, a very open a, a conception, including the role of, of price stabilization, which is a, a, the purpose of this, of, this, uh, of this research. But then in its implementation, that has been ignored. So there are a number of donor agencies that are willing to recover that part. I feel it's one of them. So the, the purpose of this research was really to, to look at that specific element. So what would be the feasibility of the food reserve that they already have in place as an emergency, as, a, as, a, as an emergency uh, uh, food system that is working pretty well, in order to expand it and do what, what uh, the Asian uh, president is, uh, is doing. No? And what, what is interesting, and that is the reason why I think that I, I mean, they, they, it's, it's frustrating and, and I think that they have been struggling, they couldn't be more prescriptive because it is all very open. The actors are very uh, cautious in, in talking about, about this. But what is interesting is that I think is waiting for, for these results to try to, to get elements from, from the research on how they could defend the case of a... Uh, so it is a... That, that's why, that's, uh, why I think that it is a very practical case because this is a negotiation that is already happening. And then I've just, on a very practical basis, I've just done a study on the, the CADA mechanism because it's a partnership and I think there's huge links there that, that could be explored that would be really useful because it's actually one of the most effective global partnerships on agriculture that, that I've seen in place. So it would be very good to link that in.